Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing the ROI of master data management is usually there. Let's run the numbers sponsored this month by Reltio. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the Q&A panel or the chat panel, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days, containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. So now let me turn it over to Anthony from Reltio for a brief word from our sponsor. Anthony, hello and welcome. Happy to be here. Thanks, Shannon. Let me get this going. Can you see my screen okay? Looks great. Thanks, Shannon. Oops. I'm Anthony Kalichio with Reltio, Senior Value Engineer, here to talk about ROI of Master Data Management. Uh, I know I write business cases almost every day. With the reality of accessible AI, businesses are expecting more and more with tighter budgets, faster and faster. Uh, but there's this trust gap. 77% of decision makers are concerned that their data is not AI ready because of poor quality, governance, and people skills. And really, who can blame them? Um, with so much dirty data in our CRMs, I, I can't tell you how often I, I hear prospects really with significant uh, dirty CRM data, more data swamps than lakes, and unreliable, slow, and accessible, or stale one-to-one -one customer experience, hyper-personalization data, who can really blame them? Uh, and as technologists, we know why. Our enterprises hoard so much data in so many systems of record and data stores. There's this sprawl that creates these silos and so much core customer account, vendor location, patient or product data fragmentation forces us to try to endlessly integrate in these one-off projects uh, date between data stores and activation destinations, creating all these versions of truth, technical debt, operational debt, and increasing friction that widens the trust gap. Reltio helps with that. Reltio is the modern cloud-native real-time data unification and management platform to help you restore trust with AI-ready unified data. If your business needs cleaner, more complete, more accessible, near real-time core data for its data lakes, CRMs, ERPs, CDPs, mobile apps, portals, IVRs, or AI applications, Reltio does that securely, scalably, scalably and flexibly. Reltio supports data governance processes and residency requirements in North America, Europe, and even China on the cloud or clouds of your choice with quantifiable iterative value realized in months, not years, because we have out-of-the-box velocity packs. You know, for years, we had customers coming up, coming to us within a certain industry, and we would keep building off these, these one-off solutions. We said, this is nuts. Why don't we just create a template or an out-of-the-box model so that when new prospects show up and they look like all of our other successful customers, we can deliver that, deliver that fast with the velocity pack. Reltio is flexible, cloud-native platform, so don't start with technology. Start with the revenue, efficiency, or mitigated risk business outcomes you're really trying to achieve. Uh, it's commonly, uh, we see investments over three-year terms, but then decompose it into more realistic short-term key value milestones that can be realized in months, not just years. Uh, looking for improved target marketing? Uh, for sales or care, Relative does that. Struggling with low self-service rates, inefficient processes, or maybe merger and acquisition friction, or you're just tired of the, that old legacy on-premise MDM software, Relative can definitely help. Uh, is compliance reporting, uh, privacy management, fraud detection too complicated, but extremely critical for your brands? Let us simplify. Uh, identify measures of success and discover how organizations like you have already iteratively realized these key value milestones, either for certain projects or if your organization funds initiatives 
uh, as say a program uh, or evergreen data products, we're seeing a rise in those type of customers. Uh, that's what you need to do first and then work backwards to consider how your first third party data storage can be unified with RELTO entity resolution, multi-domain uh, management or 360 data products. Uh, I've included some common benchmarks for, for our, our most common customers. And this is based on an analysis that Forrester did of our customers that realized about 366% over a common investment term. And as you're listening to William today, if you're looking for some more tangible numbers uh, within this framework, Forrester did it quite the same way. Uh, go to relativo.com slash TEI to see how we can align data quality, completeness, and performance quantifiably to increasing profit, repurchase rates, operating efficiencies. That's at relativo.com slash TEI. Uh, and if you're looking for more details about how our customers optimize their return on Relativo investments, I'll be back on July the 30th at Dataversity at 2 p.m. Eastern. Or if you want to do something in person, uh, I'm doing in-person workshops at the data-driven event. Relativo is a Sapphire sponsor that's in Orlando in October. Uh, thanks. Anthony, thank you so much for kicking us off. And thanks to Relteo for sponsoring today's webinar and helping to make these webinars happen. If you have questions for Anthony, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen as he'll be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Welcome everybody. Thank you also, Anthony. And I'm, I'm glad to see that you brought that uh, presentation to some numbers because that's what we're going to hit on today. Some numbers behind MDM and how do we get there? There's a lot of framework uh, involved in this and I intend to take you through that framework. So sharpen the pencils because we are going to really get into it here today. The original title of this presentation was the ROI of master data management is there. And then I paused and I thought about it. Well, you know what? It's not really there if you don't do it right, right, if you don't do it well. And so I had to caveat the title a little bit by putting the usually in there. So hopefully we do the right things. I just don't want anybody to read my title and think, oh, well, you know, we can do any old MDM on any old thing and uh, it'll produce ROI for our business. Not necessarily at all. So let's do it right. We are here uh, in terms of the year. We are over halfway through. Uh, it's one of my funnest times of the month, which is coming here with you and sharing information about this wonderful field of data management. So here we are with ROI of data management. Next month, I will be bringing you promising AI use cases for the enterprise. I'll see you back here then. And you can see my other topics there as well. Um, master data management is not AI but it supports AI. It's not big data, but it supports big data. And really it must be there for all of these things. And you're gonna hear this repeatedly throughout this presentation. I don't think it's really a choice as to whether an application needs MDM or not. The choice is, how's it gonna do it? And uh, we are talking today about doing it the right way, doing it the MDM way, if you will as opposed to what I will be calling a bespoke manner, which we do see quite a bit as well. These are some of the logos that we are associated with here at McKnight Consulting Group, a broad spectrum of big analytical vector, mixed data management platforms, data movement and operational transactional data management. So everything to do with data in the enterprise. Now let's start by laying that ROI foundation down. ROI is a skill. ROI is a way of thinking. Uh, ROI is how many executives think about things. And so I want us all to be thinking that way, at least to some degree, somebody needs to in the justification process. And uh, it's likely gonna be you. 
because you are here getting this information. So let's uh, let's bring that ROI foundation up to where we can put MDM on it, just like we can put other things. So I'm going to first acknowledge the strategic. Yes, the strategic. If you are in one of the organizations doing a project, if you are one of the 2% that you do not care about ROI, you just need to gain a competitive advantage or increase market share, or one of the things that you see here, good for you. I would suggest things change and stick around and learn about ROI because you never know when you might need it in this company or your next one uh, for MDM. But anyway, I do acknowledge that that is there. And I do acknowledge as well that much ROI is uh, paired with one of these strategic objectives. And so understand what the strategic objective is of the projects that you are supporting with ROI as well. Now, one of the first things we have to do is divide our enterprise up into workloads. This is tricky. This may seem straightforward, but it is very tricky to do it fairly. You must divide and conquer all the efforts of the organization. Each one will have a different objective. There should not be any overlapping work across different uh, uh, different workloads. And there should be no gaps either. Everything should be accounted for. A lot of times we, we leave things uh, out that really are part of the project. And you'll see this when we get into the MDM ROI. I count legal. I count uh, uh, system administration activities and so on and so forth because it's only fair. Those activities are going into my MDM project. Now, there's more than one way to do uh, a lot of the workloads. So the first step is to divide up the enterprise into workloads that make sense for you. Uh, for example, I have a client that's doing a Salesforce data cloud project, for example. Okay, so they're enhancing the customer experience with that. We got to give it a label. We got to put things in there that belong and leave things out that don't belong. It's really tricky. So when you're doing an ROI, you have to understand the domain, the scope of what that ROI is for. It's, it's very seldom that you're doing it for oh, the entire enterprise. It's usually a project, right? A project or a workload within the enterprise. And again, there's more than one way to do each of these once you drill in. So you have all these possibilities in the organization and every year you go through a budget cycle, presumably, and efforts need to get prioritized. Now, that, that whole process is whatever that process is for your organization. However, if you participate in it, or if you have a more fluid uh, uh, justification of projects that go on in your organization, say throughout the year, how do you prioritize efforts? That can be pretty tricky. I like the easy button. I like to reach for the easy button. Now, some organizations are past this. They are so good at everything that uh, they don't even need to consider whether something's easy or not because they can do hard stuff. But in my experience, many organizations cannot do the hard things easy. Okay, I hope that made sense. So look for things that are easy to do that produce quick ROI. Look for things that are prerequisites to other things. And this is really this is really uh, applicable to MDM because uh, know this. MDM is not MDM is not MDM. I don't know how many people are on the call, but you're all probably thinking of MDM a little bit differently for your organization. I'm going to help sort that out as we go along here, but that is something that you need to get on the same page with. What are we talking about here? And ROI, of course, high ROI, the higher the better, the more I want to do that project early and often. Strategic objectives, yes, need to meet those strategic objectives. So Throw these all into a pot, shake it up, do whatever you need to do, come out with a priority list of projects. And what makes ROI difficult is that the benefits can be direct or indirect. And they're probably indirect. They're probably indirect. And talking about MDM, yeah, it's, it's indirect, right? Because you're not building a master customer list so you can sell it on the market or maybe you are, but I doubt you are, you, you're building it to use in other projects like fraud detection or targeted marketing or some such thing, right? Predictive maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. You're building it to use in projects. And so we have to trust that the project is going to deliver ROI and we're doing our piece of the project. It's an important piece. 
it's a it's a um, it's a highly misunderstood piece, but it's an important piece of the project. But it's a piece. Now, ordered benefits. What makes it difficult is we're not selling the data. Like I said, we are probably enabling an activity that's enabling an activity that's maybe even yet further enabling an activity that's finally leading to bottom the bottom line ROI. Because if you're going to talk about ROI, and I think you should. If you're going to talk about ROI, you have to talk about numbers. You have to talk about sales or something increasing in terms of profit. Now, that might be an expense reduction as well. Okay, that's that's cool too. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'll hear me say this a few times, that the main thrust of my ROI efforts with MDM have to do not with ROI directly, but more with a form of it called TCO, total cost of ownership. We can do it this way or we can do it that way. We're enabling other activities in the organization. And those activities are going to drive sales and reduce expenses. And we're a part of it. Now, you might say, no, William, MDM is, we call that, we call the customer experience MDM, or we call uh, the product management of our organization. We call that MDM. Fine. Whatever you want to call things is fine, but just know what you're calling them. And I'll, I'll circle back on this because it's really important. The current state of justification, what I see is that we're really good at tasks and activities. What are the tasks and activities involved in, in, uh, in doing MBM? We're, we're kind of good at that. We got some templates. Uh, it's a service we provide. Uh, but let's look at what we're not so good at. Realistic returns. We tend to be overconfident, especially if the technology team is uh, is uh, coming up with this, this justification. They tend to be a little bit more, I shall say, aggressive about the numbers that uh, this project will affect the enterprise by. Whereas a someone in the business, someone in sales, uh, they know how hard it is. Uh, they they want that needle moved, and they might trust that the needle will move with these projects, but maybe not as far as some others may say. We're good at we're not so good at costs. Excuse me, we're not so good at costs. We're better at uh, costs than returns, but we're still not so good at costs and timelines. We're not so good at timelines. We're overly aggressive about the timelines that that we put out there usually. So be careful with all that. But that's where things are now. I hinted up upon this earlier, pro programs and projects, let's distinguish. Now, in, if I were to hazard a guess, I would say probably about 60, 70% of you are thinking of MDM as a program, but there's still 20, 30%, maybe more, that are thinking of it as a project. So let's understand this. Project, AKA workload, AKA the, the sheep that you saw, in the, behind the fences in my earlier slide, right? Okay, a project. It's a standalone project. It's built for one application. So if you're doing MDM, you're building it for the data cloud project, for the predictive maintenance project, for the this, for the that. And you're just calling it MDM. That's fine if you want to call it that. There is still a discipline to, to, to follow when you do it for a single application. And I'm going to highly suggest that you never build MDM to where you are thinking that that's, that's the be all end all of MDM. It's that one project. That's not great MDM. Remember I said it has to be usually, you know, remember I said the word usually? That's not great MDM. Great MDM is you're building it once for use many times. You're building a program, a program of enterprise data with inclusion based upon not the whims of IT, but on governance. That's an important part of this. The goal of the program is to enable the data component of the projects it supports. The projects it supports. The projects are delivering the ROI. The projects are delivering the increase in sales. The projects are delivering the reduction in and a more scalable way to do that for other projects. So yeah, the first project might bite the bullet a little bit for uh, the sake of the entire enterprise. All right, so what's ROI then? We're trying to build that ROI foundation, right? It's simply return minus investment over investment. Uh, it should always be supported with a time period because if somebody says they're gonna give me 132% ROI, 
uh, I think it's great if if that's going to be like in a month. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's so great if, if you're talking about 10 years from now. OK, so always put that time frame uh, uh, along with the ROI being returned. ROI should be presented with assumptions and risks and be itemized. Used for predicting and measuring. The same formula basically is used for predicting as well as measuring after the fact. That being said, I seldom do measurements after the fact, and I don't believe many clients do measurements after the fact. You usually know whether it's successful or not uh, after the fact. But getting into MBM, yes, we do a lot of ROI. Now, sometimes that ROI is pretty abstracted. We're trying to, with MDM, we're trying to do things like maybe raise customer satisfaction, raise our, our score for customer satisfaction, you know, that, they, that they're, you know, putting into those market surveys and so forth, whatever, something like that. Uh, and that in turn, we think will improve the bottom line of the organization. However, I suggest that unless it's known what that is, that that calculation be done somewhere so that we all can feel the right way about trying to improve that customer satisfaction score. Okay, see what I'm saying? Now, when it comes to cash flow, and this may not be proper English, but more sooner is better than less later. Uh, I probably don't need to say that, but I said it. More sooner is better than less later. And there are various formulas. I'm not going to go into deep math here today. There's payback period analysis, net present value, internal rate of return, uh, and good old ROI, which I'm showing you here. So uh, Excel and other spreadsheets have formulas for this, which we won't go into today, but it's all about cash flow. Know that. You can't go to Excel with the idea that I'm improving data quality. What is Excel going to do with that? Okay. Now this whole thing, this whole thing of ROI, I mentioned before, it's a skill. And I've got much better at it over time. I've had many lessons learned early on in consulting. I might as well have released them all as an album. Now that's what I call William's Rejection, volume 24 or whatever. Now, present, presenting the possibilities. I am not Nostradamus. And uh, I actually think he was probably pretty wrong with a lot of his predictions. He was just kind of throwing things out there, right? <laughs> uh, that's how it goes when you're talking about the future. But uh, I can kind of hone in on what we think will happen, what may happen if things go great. And yeah, sales doesn't improve 10%, they improve 20%. You know, we just really don't know, but I'm going to rely on the people who should know. And those are usually the people in the business on the front lines. They are part of the project. You can't do MDM in a shell. You can't do MDM in, in some aquarium where you're not allowed to talk to the business. And it's a very business-oriented project, more so than a lot of other so-called technology projects, even the ones I talk about. And the worst case, most everything goes wrong. It does not improve sales that much at all, okay? I have, have organizations that will hone in on that worst case. And boy, that worst case had better be good enough or if the project's not happening. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, the best case, I have uh, clients that hone in on the best case. They don't even, they're going, everything's going so well, they're used to success. They're gonna think of the best case. Okay, well, as long as everything's labeled, I've done my job. I've put it out there as I think this is the best the plan and the worst case. So do at least three of these ROIs. And you must use tangible returns, real returns, real dollar value returns. Now, here's how I like to define it, because you can, you can get kind of crazy with this. Tangible ret returns are the returns you decide to measure. Intangible returns are the returns you decide not to measure. I had a client early on that we were measuring, and this was an MDM, but we were measuring this project's return based upon, well, William, if you give me this dashboard, I won't be, I won't be uh, printing all this paper out. We'll be saving money on the paper that I, I don't, I, I don't have to print the report on, uh, and 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 it really will save on having to get another printer uh, within the next few years. And this is wow, that's really exciting that stuff right there, huh? Um, <laughs> 
Okay, so that was a ridiculous uh, tangible return. You don't want to be ridiculous about it. You want to touch on the main things, increase in sales, efficiencies in process, reduction in inventory, these things that you know drive to the bottom line. And you know how they drive to the bottom line, not things like improve customer experience and satisfaction, improve customer loyalty. Well, I say, I say not those things. Not those things unless you know, unless you know how they translate. Most organizations don't. They don't really have a good handle on that. And doing things like enhancing decision-making capabilities, improving operational efficiency. Well, you know, to what degree though? Uh, things like that. So you want to get into the real tangible returns and there's no industry standard for this. And by the way, by the way, don't get crazy with this and think that you're going to come up with the 10 tangible returns of MDM. Uh, you will spend all year doing that. Uh, it, in my experience, MDM will justify itself based upon the first one or two. If you have to go beyond that, there's a problem. Now, we do TCO. I mentioned TCO is the way, the primary way here. We're going to do the MDM ROI. We're about to get into it, but we do TCO for other things as well. Think about it. A data warehouse or a data lake, for example. We're, we're not... We're not selling subscriptions to the data. The data warehouse is enabling an activity that enables another activity that hopefully in turn leads to ROI. Maybe it's enabling the fact that all the data is there and people don't have to rummage and do data wrangling for 10 hours to get a report that they should be able to do in a minute, right? So that's that's valuable. That's to the bottom line. But that's, what a, that's a data warehouse or a data lake. Which storage medium do we use? Which cloud do you use? AWS or Azure? You know, we typically typically tend to do TCO on that. And these days, if you haven't been aware, the, I would say for the past year and a half, the industry has been undergoing serious, what we're calling or what they're calling optimization. And so uh, there's been a heightened look at the bottom line. So this has been driven home. All, this, all the theme of this presentation today has really been driven home hard in the past year and a half. I see some... Uh, I see some green shoots of the, that might be changing, but uh, I'm going to leave that out there as that. So people want to be doing TC, uh, excuse me, people want to be doing ROI, but frequently it's TCO that we're doing. So let's talk about MDM return on investment. Now you might be thinking, well, I want to justify MDM, but I'm not being asked to do ROI. I say do it anyway. I say do it anyway, because you never know when you might do a lot of work to justify it. And then it's, it's on the fence. It's, oh, by the way, how much does it cost and how much would it cost this other way? Or, or what is this project we're calling MDM? What does it drive to the bottom line? Hmm. You want to be enabled and empowered to do that. You want to go beyond. We know we need it. Have you heard that? I've heard that many times. I, I say too many times. We know we need it. Um, so this is kind of the reference architecture. We're going to put MDM in the middle, and I'm usually talking about a physical hub uh, of MDM uh, data uh, that's that's shared out to analytical and operational environments. So TCO, we're going to look at things like the analysis of the impact on multiple projects. As a matter of fact, I like to hone in on that. A single approach to achieving desired outcomes. Again, in my view, you need MDM. You need MDM for each. You need master data. I'll put it that way. You need master data for every project. How are you going to get it? That's the big question. And if you get it in different ways, different approaches, then you're, you're, you're not left with a master customer list for the organization. Yes, it's a little bit hard you, you, to do that. You want to do governance on top of it. You may not feel like you have the time for, the, for all this, but I'm really here to tell you, it does not take longer to do it right. It does not take more money to do this right. It, it takes some knowledge. It takes some knowledge and some focus, but it doesn't take more money and, and time necessarily. MDM TCO, demonstrated proficiency in the use of the relevant tools and technologies. If we do RELTO for all of our subject areas, we're going to get really good at that. We're going to get really good at that tool. We can rinse and repeat. And oftentimes, I will start the MDM journey with a client with customer or product, right? That's, what, that's where we usually start. Um, but uh, checking back over the course of time, I can see that that client has uh, client, those clients have gone into 
subject areas that I couldn't even think about and they couldn't even think about on day one, but they got so good at it and they saw the value that they just repeat. They repeat for smaller and smaller subject areas, but that's okay that they're small as long as it's providing ROI, right? So consolidation of expense streams to maximize efficiency and the fuel, full curation of key enterprise subject areas allows for maximum data utilization. Uh, I mean, which projects are going to go to the trouble of building out analytical MDM? In my experience, very few, unless you're doing it the MDM way. So very few projects are going to get all the attributes in, in the customer dimension, for example, that they could use. They're doing the bare minimum because it's hard. It's easier the MDM way. So what are we using MDM for? Customer deduplication, name, business matching, and so on, what you see here. Uh, supply chain management, things like delivery, shipments, carriers, transport modes, material sites, network management, things like applications, services, VMs, data centers, routers, switches, fabrics, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing wrong with any of this, by the way. Um, if you're not doing these things, do these things. Do these things with MDM. Great, great starting point. But there are some others. Here are some other sample applications that are improved with MDM. Retail, I won't go through all of it, but retail, we got customer location, menu items, ingredients, store locations, some of the applications, improve customer list management, et cetera. What are you trying to do? Improve average order size. Hmm, getting pretty close. Getting pretty close to ROI, fraud detection. Getting pretty close to ROI. Real-time recommendations. Oh, upsell, cross-sell, more sales. Getting pretty close to, to ROI there, but it's not quite ROI. Not quite ROI. What is ROI in this context? Retail. All this is about more sales. Well, fraud, you might say, reduced expenses. Healthcare, a lot of a lot of it's reducing costs. That's TCO. Manufacturing, building once, using many times. That's TCO. Financial, anti-money laundering stuff, reducing that, reducing anti-money laundering, um, or improving anti-money laundering, I should say. That's TCO. So the fourth column here goes, or the, the ROI, each column goes deeper than the one prior. So the objectives are are still a little bit too narrow, in my view. So that's why we move on to ROI. Master data is not an option. You'll need master data. But without a discrete focus on it, i.e. MBM, you will not get it done well. If you have a project focus, that is you're building MDM, you know, how you like to, to call MDM, you're you're calling MDM what you're doing for a given project. Okay. The focus is on the application's master data needs first uh, and foremost. Usually a small work effort to continue to get to the second and third, et cetera, application. So if you're building it for SAP, uh, the ERP, for example, uh, you're building a customer list, for example, that customer list, there's still going to be a, an effort, but I'm going to say it's a small effort comparatively to hook that list up to the data cloud project, to hook that list up to the predictive maintenance project, et cetera, et cetera. So you build it to scale and you don't have a big problem when it comes to scaling this out to the enterprise. Now, if you have an enterprise or a program focus, you still gotta have that project focus because it still has to integrate with projects. It cannot sit in isolation over here in the corner. The focus is on a subject area first. So you're building customer for the enterprise. Now, here's where a lot of my clients get stuck. They say, William, I cannot build customer for the enterprise. That means I got to talk to this person, that person, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They're not even thinking about it yet. This is a project a year out. You know, For them, how are they going to tell me the attributes? And I say, don't worry about it. Get Do all you can and, and still build it now and you will enhance it as you go along. You do not have to know the entirety of the, uh, uh, the enterprise needs over the next 10 years to do MDM. Just know what you know. Maybe it's even for one application. Know what you know, build it for, to what you know, build it scalably, build it with a tool, build it right, so that you can add on as you go. 
And either initial focus you have here needs a secondary focus on the other, and that's the big MDM leadership challenge. Now, all this being said, by the way, I wanna stick this in here. I still would only put subject areas with more than one application interest in MDM. If only one application is interested in the subject area, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's employees. Maybe only HR is interested in that. Okay, well, maybe we don't have to do it the MDM way for that. But I mean, there may be applications that are interested in, in the employee dimension. I don't know, but think about things that way. Now think about this, this. robust MDM is half of the effort for success. Look at the project list on the left, left and by no means is this exhaustive. Um, but look at the enterprise subject areas on the right. All we need to do now is cross-reference. Cross-reference each project with the subject areas. And this is sort of the beginning of my MDM roadmap. Yes. So think about customer. Um, how many of these need customer? Most all of them. Most all of them. Propensity to fraud, you want to put that attribute in there. Uh, you put in a detailed profile into customer. If you do these things, my statement at the top of this uh, slide is true. Robust MDM is half of the effort for success. If you do these things, if you put, if you put these attributes in there, if you don't, if you think of customer MDM as just sort of the flat stuff like uh, name, address, and zip code or something like that, that's it. You're not you're not enhancing it in any way with. Uh, analytical attributes like propensity to fraud. You're not putting in detailed stuff about their their geo and their proclivities and their history with you and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, that's probably, what, 20% of the effort to success. But if you do it right, you do it very scalably, that's over half. Either way, you're going to need master data. But without that discrete focus on it, you're not going to get it done well. And that means you do it with data specialists, not with application programmers who are doing it on the side and think it's easy and and we don't really need you know special skills for it like data modeling integration quality you do uh, use a tool it's operational and real time let the hub create the analytical and empowering elements i'm not going to get into that in great detail but as you can see i am stressing the importance of having analytical attributes in mdm make it dis a discrete project which means make it a make it an MDM program. That's what I like. Focus on TCO first for justification, build it to scale. And I talked about building it to the requirements that you know. So the real decision points, the real decision points are just roadmapping it. That's it. It's not, it should not be a big decision as to whether we do this collectively or not. We do it one off for every project. That, that's if you think about it, that doesn't make sense. What makes sense to do is to build it once, use it many times. So it's road mapping around getting sponsorship, what subject areas uh, are important uh, in what order. And by the way, and I'm skipping over this, but a subject area, defining a subject area could be a whole webinar in and of itself because it's not as, not as simple in many organizations to simply say, oh, customer, mm, no. That might be way too big of an apple to, to bite off. Uh, and it may be very nuanced such that you don't have the same governance around different aspects of customer and so on and so forth. So that gets really complicated too. Publishers or workflow. How are you going to build out the customer or the whatever subject area? Are you going to use the workflow enhancements or uh, capabilities of MDM? I say yes, wherever possible. Mm, don't forget third-party data. Third-party data enriches data. And I think MDM is a great place for third-party data. And you're road mapping around who are the subscribers. If you're, if you're doing all this and you have no subscribers, nobody cares about the MDM hub, nobody's using it, you have not done very much. You have just spent money. You have to have subscribers. You have to have quote-unquote customers for MDM applications. And don't forget the common stuff like the data warehouse, the data lake and the op and operational data hubs and so forth. It doesn't have to be a traditional application. It could be 
Well, the data warehouse needs MDM data, the data lake and so on. A lot of communications are necessary here and building out your governance to support this is also necessary. So great leadership is definitely required. Um, I like to go around the organization at these early, early points and ask different business areas, will you sponsor me? Will you, will you sponsor MDM? Um, and, and, and it's a real skill. It's a real skill and there's, there's art involved in this as well around okay you got you got a uh, you, you have you have you have someone that's interested but but they're interested in a subject area that's relatively insignificant you know do you go for that or not hey i'm not going to take away your judgment calls on a daily basis you do what you got to do but uh you do have to get out there and ask the questions and get some get some data on the on the tables that you can sort through and make real good decisions from so getting back to Another example, uh, fraud detection. Most fraud detection is transaction heavy. Sync MDM to the edge. The customer attributes that you want to include are the last in transaction and, and so on. Last in transactions, average, high, low transaction profiles. These are some of those analytical uh, attributes. Plus third party data is very interesting here in uh, fraud detection and so on. Now I have circled a few, hopefully you can see this on the slide. I've circled a few data domains or subject areas that I think are involved in fraud detection. Uh, the reality is um, there's probably more, but anyway, I'm looking for the basics. I'm looking for what minimally do I need to master and to what degree do I need to master them in order to move the needle on fraud detection. And then I'll move it some more as I build out those subject areas and I add more subject areas and so on. Um, you want to get that needle moving because a little bit goes a long way when it comes to stuff like fraud detection. If you can drop it by a point, whew, boy, you've done a lot. Yeah, that, that's millions of dollars right there. So I'm looking to drop it by a, a point at least uh, to begin with. And I know that if I master customer, for example, maybe just customer, I can get somewhere. I don't know where, you know, we do the math. But if I start building out these other interesting subject areas, you know, what's left? What is left for fraud detection after I build out all these subject areas? Not much, not much. Now, if you believe me so far, use the cost of building master data. Put a time limit on it, like three years. And if you don't know what time limit to put on it, I say three years. That seems to be good, maybe even a little bit long, but that's that's what I'll, I would say. It's only milestones until there's value produced. You build, built the MDM hub, Great. Who's using it? What are they doing with it? So taking my retail example, look at all these applications that I had on that pr prior slide, improving customer list management and so on and so forth. Those projects have their own ROI. I am not, as the MDM person, I am not being asked for the ROI of those things. Are you? Well, that's that seems backwards unless we're calling the whole thing MDM and it's a project. You see what I'm saying? Okay. If it's understood that MDM is not an option, MDM actually de-risks these projects because you're providing data as a service. So some of these things are new, like new menu item introduction. They're in the constitution, if you will, of the retail establishment. It's going to happen. It is going to happen every year. We re we readdress our menu every year, and so that's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. You know it's going to need data. So the only question becomes: Where is it getting? Where is it getting the new data? Where is it getting it? Is it getting it from uh, MDM, or is it going to get it from a bespoke method? Now, when it comes to costing MDM, uh, these are funny numbers, by the way. Don't don't take them to heart. Um, and and this is what we do: it's labor as well as the MDM costs. MDM costing is really not that complicated. Something like the number of what they call domains, uh, that can be a conversation, but what they call domains, uh, and then how many records. Um, simply put for a lot of the, uh, the vendors out there, not all, but there's that, there's that cost, there's the cost of the people. Like I mentioned before, it's only fair, only fair to burden in the cost of that data governance board, PMO, oversight of the project, legal, we're gonna to have to check with them. 
in terms of what we're doing. We almost always do these days. The executive sponsor contribution, so on and so forth. You might have a, it's nice when you can just put a kind of a, I don't know, a, um, a, a one, a single kind of salary figure across the board, but good luck with that. Uh, with all of these different uh, labels on there. Anyway, you, you come up with a labor figure as well as a MDM uh, costing figure. That includes product support, maintenance, and upgrades. Make sure it does. Now, here's kind of a money slide. Let's think about this. Again, that retail situation, they're doing those four things. Uh, it's on their roadmap. They're going to do it. So the only question is how. If you improve customer list management in a bespoke way, that's going to cost just, just the cost of master data. I'm not talking about the whole multi-million dollar application. Just the cost of, of master data. Let's say 500000 And I'm, I'm not off base here, by the way, either. Real-time AI-based recommendations, 500000 for that. New menu item introduction. Well, that's kind of light on master data, 100000 Ensure consistency across stores, 250000 Whatever it is for you. Do the math. The, the, the total comes out to $1.35 million. Master data management, however, would cost you $550,000. Yes, based upon the prior slide and running down those numbers. Now, but William, you said there would be an additional small cost of integrating master data with each application. Okay, there it is. 25, 25, 10, and 5. It's small if you did it right. And so the total comes out to about half. And yeah, that's my experience. Uh, about half, about half to do it at the MBM way as opposed to bespoke master data. Not to mention, well, to mention, I guess, <laughs> that doing it the bespoke way skips a lot of the goodies that are inherent within good MDM, that are inherent within MDM tools like data integration, data modeling, data quality, a good place to put third-party data, the workflow. Wow, that's, that's really valuable. An outlet for data governance a place where data governance can be leveraged in the organization. That's MDM. MDM, and I'd say maybe the data warehouse as well, but it's it's places of high leverage. Okay, so you have you know you need data governance. That'd be another webinar to justify that, but you know you need it, right? So you do all this good data governance stuff. You come up with these great definitions for your customer, uh, some some rules about maybe data security and who gets to see what and what's PII and where you have to be careful and all that good stuff. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with all those rules? You're going to go out one by one to every place where that data is and uh, and apply those rules. Yes, you are, but hopefully you don't have too many. Hopefully you you have MDM. So usually bespoke MDM. Usually this this way. I'm talking about no tool. And usually you attend to one of these, like data integration, but not the others, not, not well anyway. So look around. Is there really an existing system in your organization that can serve the need? Are your data management processes and governance established and effective? Do you have clear and reliable data stewards that you can depend upon? Is it worth replicating the functionality of an MDM tool? When we are close to meeting the needs without one? Yeah, I, I grant you these questions. I grant you these questions, but I think that the answer will come back, no. So now let me shift gears quickly for the 40% the of you or the 30% of you that call MDM an actual application within the organization. Hopefully by now, you know what I'm talking about. It's a project within your organization and a project needs ROI. You're trying to reduce churn, improve share of wallet, these things, okay? You just have to show that the ROI of the project is greater than of doing MDM ROI within the project is greater than the bespoke master data. So you're going to get more, more, more value, more juice out of the project if you do it the MDM way. And I already showed you before uh, the calculation that you would use. Well, I didn't show you the detail, but the calculation comes up to the $550,000 for MDM. This is application ROI showing that the MDM ROI is greater than bespoke master data. We've done that. Now, one of my pet peeves, this is, I'm gonna get on a soapbox for just a minute here. One of my pet peeves is uh, all these case studies that the vendors put out and, 
and they claim all the value of, of the application. Well, there's more to an application than just that single vendor, right? <laughs> and uh, there's also uh, way more to, um, there's way more possibilities as to how that organization could have done that project and give the organization some credit for coming up with the project. And uh, the vendor wants to take all the credit. So watch out for that, watch out for that. It's the, the credit's theirs, but the credit is also gonna be yours for formulating great projects. Now, if you have other ideas, uh, go ahead and put that in the Q and A. And we're gonna get to Q and A in a few minutes here. I look forward to that. Application ROI is stuff like you're gonna increase the profit of the organization. I mean, that's the bottom line. Profit can be increased by sales. Uh, and it's not just the, the dollar fig figure of the sale, right? It's the it's the profit of that sale. It can also be, profit can also be increased by a reduction in expenses. Whatever it is, whatever it is, if you're doing application ROI, if you're calling your MDM an application, do it like this. So you got doing MDM and doing the application, if that's how you want to phrase it, or if you're doing the application, which happens to include MDM, however you want to phrase it, the total comes out to what you see here. The R minus I over I comes out to what you see here. That's a nice big number. After three years, 600% cumulative ROI. And this doesn't even include cost. I didn't include cost of money here to complicate things, but you probably should do that as, uh, that as well. Um, and I don't know what your threshold is, but for most of my clients, 600% ROI after three years, that would that would win the day that would win the day. We would do that project if they believe me. <laughs> and they usually do. Uh, where do you look for these great MDM opportunities that are producing to the bottom line of your organization? Look at the products you make and the services you offer. Look at the supply chain. Look at your business operations. Look at the intelligence that you use in designing your product and service and the intelligence in your marketing and your approval funnel. And I gave you some ideas earlier as to what a lot of companies are doing now with MDM. And then I gave you some examples from industry. So that's where you look. So let's maximize, let's take it to another level now. Let's, we're, 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 we, we believe we're gonna get ROI out of MDM. Let's maximize it. Let's be sure that we're not, we're not one of the ones that I had to put the usually in the title for, okay? Enterprise data, that's master data. It's ready when it's in a leverageable platform, not when it's in, Joe's spreadsheet, it's, it's ready when it's in an appropriate platform for its profile and usage. When it's in a great MDM tool with high non-functionals, data captured at a granular level, data is at a data quality standard as defined by data qualms, get data governance. You're not just slinging data around the organization. Oh, however it landed, that's what we're gonna do with it. Uh, projects are a series of subject area mastery. Projects are a just, that's it. Projects are a series of subject area mastery. Here is one way you could build out a life cycle. Keep in mind, you are building data as a service. So you have SLAs in, involved with that in terms of what do you do versus what does an application team do to get the data. Remember, MDM data is pretty small. It's nimble, it's accessible. It's not necessarily big data. It supports big data projects. And don't forget those analytical attributes, which I call empowering attributes. Don't just have a flat uh, MDM here. There's a lot of things you can do with it. Have fun with it. Make, make it, make it be half of the projects that are coming up that need this data. So in summary, ROI has become essential. Workloads provide ROI. Master data is not an option. Robust MDM is half of the effort for success. And using a tool helps ensure you get all the benefits of MDM, which are eventually needed. MDM approaches are usually about TCO. It's just a better way to go about doing things. Bespoke methods usually cost more and have less leverage once built. Occasionally, MDM is conflated with one of its applications like CX. And that's where we do ROI for CX. That's a lot of letters there. MDM opportunities are everywhere. Build a subject area for the enterprise and repeat and enhance as time goes on and you get more ideas about what you could, could, have, could have done for that subject area that you put in production. That's okay. 
that's okay. Things don't have to come together whole cloth for you to get moving. And build MDM with data as a service in mind. So the ROI of master data management, Shannon, it's usually there if these things are followed. <laughs> I love it. That was a great ending. Thank you, William, so much for another fantastic presentation. I love it when you're so good at walking us through how to do things. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being so engaged. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the q and I'm just going to dive in here since we've got a few minutes left. Um, Anthony, there's a question in here uh, about what databases uh, Relteo supports. Do you have a link or a resource for that availability? Sure, I can I can provide that after the call. But in general, we're a cloud native platform on uh, Google, AWS, Azure, uh, and the underpinning is is uh, generally uh, agnostic. So uh, I can I can share some community links where you can get into some technical details. Perfect, thank you. So uh, when it comes to MDM, what percentage is technology and tools, and what percent is process? William, you want to start that off? Um, okay, great question. Um, there's a lot of process involved, a lot more than in usual uh, in, in our the projects that we might be used to, and that throws people. So I'm going to say um, technology is maybe 40% and process is 60%. That'll be where I draw the line. I have customers of different maturity levels, and so that, that really matters. Uh, some of them are, you know, they're trying to hit a nail into the wood with a screwdriver. Um, so, yeah, I, it's kind of hard to say. Yeah, um, well, perfect. Well, I will move on here. Let's try to see if I can get us slip in a couple more questions here. So if the value of MDM is so closely associated with the value of the projects it supports, how can we estimate a standalone ROI for MDM? Yeah. Um, well, what you do, I'm going to go back to us to the slide that I uh, kind of covered that on, which is um, back, 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 back here. There it is. There it is. Running away. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, what you have to do is is figure out. Well, what does it cost to do MDM within all these applications? Is it costs? It costs something. It costs a lot. It costs a lot to do it in, in a bespoke way. And, and and it's not leverageable versus build doing an doing it as a project with experts and a tool and so on and so forth and then just hooking up that data with data as a service to the applications and it doesn't take long usually the first application for you to to cross that 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 line to where it's less expensive less t or more tco uh, less tco i should say for the mdm way versus the bespoke way so that's the way I know to do it and the way that I do it. That's generally what I do as well. Um, some, depending on maturity level and what's going on, sometimes it's projects, sometimes it's program. Um, you can kind of think of it as like, what cost did I avoid? That's another way to do it. Or you could do a summation over the a set of projects uh, for the way our for the ways our customers usually do it. You can go to relativo.com slash TEI to, to look at the report. Mm, love it. Um, and, and Anthony, maybe if you send me a link, I'll include that in the follow-up as well. Um, we just, you know, have less than a minute here. So I'm going to say, okay, can you answer, let's see if I can challenge you guys to answer this in any kind of a yes, no with, uh, with your very quick pitch. If we could revamp and better architect our applications, would we really need the big, heavy, complex MDM infrastructures most organizations have been implementing? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, and yes, and who says it's heavy and onerous? Um, exactly. Like, exactly. Like grandpa's MDM. Um, it could exactly. be. It could be nimble. It could be light. Depends on what we're trying to accomplish. How we measure success. I love it. Thank you so much. Oh, perfect elevator pitches. Um, thank you both so much for this great presentation. And thank you, Anthony and to Reltio for sponsoring today's webinar and to help making these webinars happen. We appreciate it as 
always. Um, thank you guys so much. And thanks for our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of the webinar along with Realtio's contact information. Thanks everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.